Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I am JT O'Sullivan. Today, the first ever quarterback school in-studio guest, San Francisco 49er head coach Kyle Shanahan. Fired up. Let's get it going. Welcome to the QB School. So, Coach, thank you so much for being here. Fired up to talk a little bit of ball, talk a little bit of 49ers, quarterback, all of the above, maybe even some nepotism. Let's get it going. First, though, right out the gate, why are we doing this? First one from my guy, Young Bull. Is it just me, or does Kyle Shanahan kind of look like the quarterback school? I think it's the other way around, but whatever. Next one from my man, Jay Lane. Kyle Shanahan look like JT O'Sullivan. Meh. Next one, my guy, Tony Nagatini. Maybe. I think we need to make sure J.T. O'Sullivan isn't the Mirror Universe version of Kyle Shanahan. Hashtag 49ers. Crickets, crickets, crickets. Quote tweeting my guy Jordan Reed saying nice things about it. Appreciate it. Last one here from Sour Death Sam. J.T. O'Sullivan and Kyle Shanahan 100% have sibling energy. Really? And then Tony coming in hot. What JT looks like the CGI version of Kyle if he were cast in The Irishman? So, Mike, obviously people think that we look alike. Obviously, probably not the worst thing in the world for you. But for me, just being able to put it out there, what we look like right next to each other, I appreciate you coming on. I really do. I know probably most people, myself included, want to talk a little bit about the quarterback position, what it looks like for the Niners right now. Feels a little bit like a hot mess on certain levels. We got injuries. We're bringing in new players. We're wasting draft picks. We'll give you an opportunity to kind of describe exactly what's going on, what you hope kind of develops there. I know your boy John Lynch came out recently with the whole leader in the clubhouse saying you reaffirmed it by kind of cementing Brock Purdy as kind of that guy right now with how well he's played. But let's be honest. We gave up a lot for Trey Lance. You gave up a lot for Trey Lance, I should say. It hasn't worked out up until this point. What are you thinking? What are we thinking? What can we expect moving forward from the quarterback position, the 49ers, in your offense? Yeah, I think we're going to start whoever gives us the best chance to win. That's pretty boring, coach. We got to play them one day at a time. I'm just happy to be here. Hope I can help the ball club. I just want to give it my best shot. And the good Lord willing, things will work out. All right. Beyond the quarterback position specifically, who's playing, who's not, Let's talk a little bit about the quarterback injuries that have happened for you. Really, we could go back pretty far here. We'll just do the past year. I think at the end of season press conference, uh, Jason Cole asked a really respectful, thoughtful question about just what you're thinking, if anything, about potentially protecting the quarterback a little bit better, being hesitant about making certain calls with these quarterbacks because so many have gotten hurt, most recently four and you kind of snapped back at him a little bit, I would say. Yeah, I think when you ask that question, I would understand. I think common sense would tell you um, when you look at the injuries. Yeah, let me cut you off right there a little, Shani. Uh, let's pretend and operate under the assumption that I have no common sense. And for the case of where we are today, let's look at some actual video evidence that we can kind of pull apart, pick apart, perhaps analyze to see where these injuries really do come from. Because if they're so common to you, they might not be so common to everyone else. So let's take a peek at exactly what those injuries look like this past year. So the first one we're going to look at here, Coach Shanahan, is going to be Trey Lance's injury. Now, to me, this is a bit of a fancy formation. 3 by 2 FIB, shift to 2 by 2 We're going to run Bash GT. And... For me, of the four injuries, this is probably the least concerning for a few different reasons. One, you drafted the guy to be a dual threat guy. You want to change the math. Let's change the math. That's what you're doing. Now, the execution of this, I've got some issues with. And to me, that's going to come back to coaching and the choices that we're making. So let's just first be on the same page. What are we talking about? Bash GT. Well, this is a, we're going to read this player right here. The bash element of this is back away. So we're going to be able to read this conf conflict defender on the edge. Give our quarterback, Trey Lance, two shuffles. One shuffle, two shuffle. If, he can if this conflict defender can tackle the bash, then we're going to pull it and run the GT part of it, the counter part of it. 
So the read is to pull it. He makes the right read. Now, choices-wise, and this is going to come down to a lot of choices on these injuries up front. What are we doing up front? Bash GT is usually the front side. So if we're running to this side, the front side is going to be, and I know you know this coach, but I'm going to go over it for, for the people. It's going to be gap down, gap down, gap down. Then we're going to pull kick, and we're going to what I'm going to call pull wrap to the play side inside linebacker. Now, the secret sauce here is what do you do when there's no one in your gap to the play side? So there's no one here. So gap down backer usually means you go down and you can go up to this backer immediately. But I think most people who live in this world, or many people, would like a double team at the point of attack. So you double team this 4-I, the te technique there, and not only does it secure the play side, but it gets you a little bit more penetration, and then you double up to that backer. So if we were to do that, this 4-I technique right here, who has a great get off, he wouldn't spike this thing and really ruin this play. So when we don't double team, which is a coaching decision for me, he spikes it, ruins it. He's going to knock off the guard. Now the guard makes a nice adjustment, still gets a kick out here. But our all-world left tackle is going to get knocked off. He's going to kind of look stunned to me, to be honest with you, kind of wander here. And no one's going to block the play side inside linebacker who's going to hurt our quarterback. So for me here, beyond common sense, and forgive my common sense for not being common, I don't like the fact that there's not a double team at the point. Our right tackle's taking an L. Our left tackle looks lost and confused, like he's not coming off aggressive here. And our quarterback gets hurt because of it. So the design to run the quarterback, you're going to do it with a dual threat guy. That's why you drafted him. That's why you gave up three first round picks. But how can we execute like that? Again, watch the four eye to start with the right tackle. Gets off, beat. Okay, so penetration. Right guard, 74, no double team. It's going to knock off the pulling guard. He makes it through, but the left tackle doesn't. All world? All world? Oh, hell no. That is rough. So right out the gate, the first one, the one that I'm going to say probably the least of my issues because this is more execution than anything else. But I think you're making some choices up front that are L's. Some of our best players aren't playing like they're our best players. And our quarterback gets hurt. So to say that this is just common, like, oh, if we just look at this, we'll understand. Um, What? Well, I'm looking at it. I don't understand. Okay, now let's look at the next one. Next one, week 13. Third and six, Jimmy Garofalo. Another fancy formation, shift, motion. This time, verse zero, hot, have no answer, guy falls on our leg, hurt. I mean, again, forgive my ignorance and lack of common sense, but to me, this looks like a design flaw. Okay, and it looks like it's layered in design flaws. Now, are there also maybe some execution errors? For sure. Okay, first of all, let's just talk about what this play is. The bones of this play look like what I'm going to call and what I think they call in the West Coast world still choices. So basically little option routes from the backfield. Now, it's also important to look like this looks like a seven or a corner from Kittle. Okay, this is verse zero. There's nobody back here. They've got essentially what I'm used to calling like a punt rush front. Who knows who the hell's coming? But at the end of the day, you're getting five eligibles out. Right, coach? So there's the choice. There's the choice. Now, the thing about these choice routes, specifically from the backfield, is that they're usually run by backs. So, we've got a really good one right here. Oftentimes, on a choice where you come up here, you can sit it down versus zone, you can run away versus man, you can potentially take the middle in some offenses, but you can also come out and you have to run hot flat if you think you're hot. So, right here, it looks like McCaffrey does that. But it doesn't look like Samuel does. He looks like he doesn't know this part of it. So is that on him for not being not being able to do it? Maybe. Is it on you for putting him in the backfield? Maybe. Probably. Is it on Jimmy for looking like he's supposed to throw it there? You know, and being shocked? I don't think so. You know, maybe he could throw it to Kittle on the corner if he knew, like for sure, that Samuel doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't know that that's a part of this route. Maybe. You know, up front. Again, you know, this to me is something we'll talk about later, but potential deficiency in the drop back game, just having hot answers. It looks like Jimmy's trying to do this thing to the left. 
It looks like his eyes are in the right spot. And it looks like Samuel runs a true choice instead of breaking it off and running a hot. So I'm not sure what's common about this, buddy. You know, let, let's play this thing out. Again, does it look like, do you need this fancy shift motion, first of all? I don't think so. Over fancy. It looks like Jimmy's looking left. It looks like he knows he's hot. But we get no uh, we get no hot flat. We get no quick hot route. Up top, see the up top? That's what I'm talking about with McCaffrey. He runs that thing like he's hot. Boom, flat. Now we're hurt. We got people falling on our legs. All sorts of issues. Again, protection-wise, it looks like we've got issues. It sure looks like 64 is going to the right. Okay, so I'll let this thing play and then come back. 64 goes to the right. That means the left guard, left tackle are squeezing. And there's the hot. It's pretty simple. The left guard actually, I think, makes a mistake here. But if the center is going right here, and this is just five-person protection, you call it whatever you want, scat right, scat left, I don't care. It looks like the left guard is confused, but the left tackle is so good that he essentially pushes him down into the correct guy. So we end up getting it blocked correctly. This is the guy we're hot off of. He's the guy we want to be hot off, the widest side. We just don't get any hot route from him right here. And why do we not get it? Because he's a wide fucking receiver. And he's not used to running this from the backfield. That's why, bro. So, not common. Again, <laughs> we chokes aside. I mean, I don't know. I would be pissed if I was getting hurt like this. Uh, 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 what? He's looking. He knows he's hot. There's nowhere to go. So it's either a design flaw, a player error, or we're putting in a position, a player in a position that he doesn't have the answers to. And now our guy is hurt again. Next one here, the Purdy injury. Now, Mike, I've heard you say that these were injuries on normal dropbacks. This doesn't look like normal dropback to me. This looks like fancy play action. We're taking a shot. And our backup tight end looks like he's blocking a really good NFL edge player, one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, again, with my my common sense, obviously, is not that common. But that's a long-ass time for a backup tight end to hold up on an edge. And that is just an absolute bummer, horrific injury to happen to a guy who's playing so well. That's such a great story. Now, again... A normal dropback to me is a five-step throw it. Not a whatever this is. Let's just pretend they've got you guys have so many different runs, so many different play actions. Who knows what the hell this is? We're gonna fake weak side inside zone. We're gonna fake the around here. We're gonna try to get what looks like we're gonna go to the deep corner here, a flag, and it looks like Kittle's on like an in or a crosser. So you're asking a backup tight end. To hold up one on one here. Now you probably hope that this edge player is threatened by this, but again, 19 here with some horrific effort, in my opinion, he should be burning this thing to put some serious threat here. Another trick of the trade, and this is only from a former high school football play calling head coach, but if you're not going to go hard here, you can at least have this guy add on and be part of the pass protection unit to give essentially like a bookend to this tight end. So allow him to lose with dignity to the outside, knowing that he's got this kind of buffer out here. Because when you fake this thing coming around, just come out here and settle here. Because really this is only a two-person route. You've got the deep flag and you've got the inner crosser here. That's it. Now if you're the other part about this is what is the intent of the play? Is the intent of the play to the deep shot or the over? If it's the over, well then shit, we can really keep Kittle in. We can slow release this and just have him like check out into the shallow. So to me, these are all choices, none of which are common. And they all come back to the play caller, the offensive architecture, because our quarterback just got his arm blown off. Not normal drop back. Again, you be the judge. You tell me about 19's effort here, coach. Little Shanny. That looks like shit to me. And it looks like you're putting your backup tight end in a really tough spot in the most important game of the year. And now it's essentially over. So again, to come sideways at a really good question, just because you don't want to admit the answers, doesn't mean that the film is going to say something different. 
the other part about this is there are so many choices you can do here. And I know you want the run to look like, or you want the play action to look like the run, but, okay, let's, let's just assume we block it like they block it, which is essentially everybody down here, which is fine. This is tough, okay, it's, it, it just is. I really think the easiest answer is to put Debo on a fast fake and then throttle this thing down and to be an edge blocker here. I'm telling you, it's not that hard. Done it in high school. Okay, the other thing you could do is just say, the hell with the fake, it doesn't matter, and just go 5-0 here. Now you got a lot of one-on-one -on -one blocks here, but at least you get your right tackle out on the true edge and you give him a buffer with the tight end and you essentially say, hey, you know, hang out in here, let's get a good fake, make sure you don't see any color bleed off so we can make a throw down the field. There are just so many different options than this and to be defensive of this. This is putting your tight backup tight end in a rough spot. This is putting your quarterback in a dangerous spot. And at this point, it looks and feels like it's a dangerous position to play for your system. The last one here, Josh Johnson, again, doesn't look like a normal drop back to me. It looks like a 2004 under center seven step drop trying to throw a corner stop to me. Now, I like the fact that you make the adjustment to go eight person protection, but let's not get it twisted. Eight person protection here with the tight end and use check basically being the chippers. So every NFL team runs some iteration of this. We're gonna chip the edges, right? Don't wanna get our quarterback hurt again. Eight person protection. You've got the five offensive linemen and the three extra players. But the thing about this here is that McCaffrey looks like he's running this like he's the primary. And normally I would say, I love this from the back. But when you're struggling to pass protect, let's have some sort of call where these guys hang in here. So it's not just a chip, it's a chip and hang. It's a slow release. It's essentially, hey, have your head on a swivel, swivel this thing, and if you see any color, bleed off. So you see green flash here. Well, then you stop your check down and you take the edge off, and then you get into the check down late. It's second and 14. It's second and 14, we're under center, taking a seven stop, step drop. To me, this is not normal drop back. This is hold on to your ass. We're in deep shit. And we're in even deeper shit now. So it's just the, it's the, the attitude of the response. And then the video just says the opposite. Like th it really does. Like I, to me, the thing about all these besides the, the Trey Lance one is they're all fixable. They all have weird choices. It's not that they're terrible by any means, but there are choices up front, pass protection things that are a deficiency of this system. And that's just what the video evidence shows. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just like your opinion, man. To me, they're normal dropbacks, normal plays. Dual threat guy gets hurt, three normal dropbacks. It's unfortunate when quarterbacks get hurt. All right, coach, let's... uh. Agree to disagree potentially on the common sense element and how freak of these injuries they really are. I want to acknowledge I think there's at least some level of a pattern, something that's concerning that at least is going to require some sort of change to be able to consistently have a quarterback make it through the season. Next, let's transition into one of my favorite topics in the league. Not sure necessarily how you feel about it, but we're going to talk about nepotism. We're going to talk about exactly what that looks like for you, what role that's played in your life, in your uh, career trajectory. I know that when I look across the landscape of the league, it sure looks like that plays a major role in a lot of these quote-unquote young superstar, boy wonder, opportunity-laden kind of early career moves that allow people to become head coaches, play callers earlier than maybe some other people who had to play or quote-unquote pay their dues. But can you talk a little bit about what nepotism is to you, how it's played a role in your life? Because it sure feels like it's played an important role, whether it be your upbringing, your opportunity to be you know, a ball boy, for you to be who you're friends with in college, maybe some tattoos, some initials, maybe your first head coach opportunity as far as the CEO, having some nepotism in his career trajectory, you know, there's so much nepotism. There's so many Nepo babies in the Bay Area that even the local media have to deal with the Nepo issues. And so just what does it mean to you? How do you make sense of it? And how have you kind of come out the other side of it potentially? 
Um, by no means is nepotism not a big deal in the NFL. You know, a lot of people think the NFL stands for not for long. You know, the inside joke and the inside inside joke is it's a nepotism football league. And I think that there is a lot of truth to that. You know, to not say that ne- nepotism played a massive role in my life would be a me being disingenuous and all I'm all about being authentic with my players and being buddies, being truthful. And so I got my start in the league, you know, through the Nepo pipeline with Gruden. You know, everybody seemingly who's a Nepo baby came to see him come through that quality control role with the Bucks and everyone's least favorite Gruden. So to then go from there to getting a job with Kube and then, you know, getting some elevated roles and then being able to hire some little Kubes, you know, it does bring that kind of Nepo full circle for sure. For me, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to apologize for it. I think my daddy told me that the best thing I could do is to go out there and not work for him so that I could earn the respect of the players. Although when you pull it back and realize that I only got those shots because of my Nepo relationships, it doesn't really matter that I went to work for someone else's dad when my dad got me the job. But regardless, (laughs) I would like to make the argument that I'm good enough that it would have happened on its own. Now, it wouldn't have happened immediately. I wouldn't be in my early 40s and have 20 years of experience unless I was a Nepo baby. Okay, let's just be honest with that. And I think if you look across the landscape of the league, the reality is that a lot of these organizations are just family-run businesses and there's nepotism up and down the organizations. I think the most troubling thing is the fact that when you look at the coaches and specifically the head coaches, because of the optics of what they look like, what we look like being kind of old white guys, younger white guys, you know, quote unquote, a bunch of boy wonders, geniuses, you know, how much of that is true and how much of that is, you know, being born into the right family, the genes, the last name, the royalty last name. And that's probably don't have to be an investigative reporter to realize that there are some opportunities that come through nepotism in this league that would be hard to replicate in any other industry, any other, you know, billion dollar business. And so besides for acknowledging it for what it is, hard for me to make sense of it or be able to explain it any better way. Yeah, I think for me, it's about the initial opportunity. And that's one of the hardest things to wrap your mind around if you don't have that access to this small network of family, of friends, cronyism, of this kind of recycled coaching kind of carousel, that how do you get that initial opportunity if you can't have your daddy call someone to get you a job, or you can't have your grandpa reach out because he was in personnel, or those types of things. If you didn't grow up in the industry, it just feels like you're automatically eliminating a lot of potentially really good candidates who also... Okay, this is an important part, who also better represent the actual optics of what the league looks like, the league's makeup. If all these people that are quote-unquote Nepo babies all look like the same type of guy, white, young, probably could never have played in the league, and they all get access to the early jobs, the best jobs, coaching the quarterback, calling plays, the quick pipeline to the head coaching role. How do you make sense of that for you and make it better moving forward by while also acknowledging the fact that it's the only reason that you got your opportunity so young? I can't guarantee anybody's going to be alive this Sunday, let alone guarantee the hopefully experience that I can cultivate for people who don't look like me, who don't have the same last name that I have, who don't, who haven't had their family give them opportunities that they've had to earn to continue to do that. I think it's important. I think I have shown that I'm essentially the leader in the clubhouse across the landscape of the league as far as giving diverse candidates their first opportunity to either call plays or get that next stepping stone towards being a head coach. So for that, I think the evidence speaks for itself. But Again, I'm all about being authentic with my players. 
So to say that it's that I'm not a Nepo baby would just be disingenuous and I'd be hiding the fact that I would never be in this opportunity without my dad's last name and what my dad did in this league. And my dad should be in the Hall of Fame. Now that is true. That's some real talk, both from you and from me. So I appreciate it and want to acknowledge that the good that you're doing as far as the diverse hires that are coming out of your staff, your program, your organization. Now let's transition here to finish this thing up and talk about what I think are some blind spots in your quote unquote genius, unique, really powerful offensive system and philosophy. For me, when I look at it, and this is obviously from the outside in, you know, not watching every single snap, acknowledging all those things, it seems like y'all obviously are committed to a philosophy, a system. And I think it's obviously worked across the landscape of the league in a bunch of different spots for a bunch of different organizations. I'm thinking, you know, wide zone running, nakeds, keepers, boots, play action, those types of things to be able to be really successful statistically offensively. But for whatever reason, when I turn on the film, and, you know, besides for the quarterback play injuries, across the years, it's looked like the drop back passing game is not as sophisticated, not near as sophisticated, not near as robust as the run game, as the play actions, as even potentially the number of pass protections that y'all carry. So that when you have to throw it, and eventually it seems like you have to throw it in the league nowadays, especially in the more meaningful games versus the better opponents, for whatever reason, you haven't been able to. And I think it's a combination of a lot of things from one of the main things being you're such a control freak. You've got some, you know, puppeteer elements of, hey, quarterback, just do what I tell you to do when you're supposed to do it, which really works during the regular season. But when you need that creative element, when you need that big play, when you got to throw it, it hinders the development of that player to be able to execute at that moment in the biggest moments. I think, you know, I think that there are potentially some toolkit deficiencies in the hot game, in the ability for the quarterback to play the position at the line of scrimmage just because the word, the calls are so damn long. You know, I think back to like the Super Bowl, Matt Ryan running out of time, taking a rough sack in the fourth quarter. You know, I think of Jimmy G missing the post throw. You know, there are a number of opportunities in some of those conference championship games where, you know, just being able to allow the quarterback to flourish, to elevate his teammates as opposed to your system elevating everyone. Whether it be, you know, is it your system or is it, hey, these players getting the absolute best out of them doing what they do and allowing them to grow and develop and evolve into a drop back passing game because for the kind of comprehensive library of run plays, of play actions, to then look at the drop back game and realize, damn, is everything a pure progression? Like, are we just going one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and just trying to rip it into whoever's the number one read? Because that's what it looks like as opposed to stressing a defense with different concepts vertically, horizontally, packaged together based on what we expect to see defensively. And so it just feels like that's a natural blind spot that for whatever reason, hasn't been recognized, refused to be acknowledged. And maybe I'm totally off my rocker and you're the guru, you're the genius, and you already know all these things. But if you do, it hasn't been fixed. So there's some sort of void here for me, whether it's, you know, you never get the feedback where, you know, potentially all your great coaches have been hired away, or there's some sort of void here between what has happened in the past to make you really successful to what you probably need to happen moving forward to be able to win the ultimate Super Bowl and then stay there and win it a few times and take advantage of what that dynasty type vibe feels like because it feels like everything is there except a handful of things that are most tethered to the quarterback position and your guru, your baby, your system that for whatever reason can't or refuse to get fixed or changed. So make it make sense to me. Look, I'm a bit of a dick. A control freak, no doubt. But there are only so many elite quarterbacks in the league. And if we don't have one, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to control the outcome of that situation. You want to call it being a quarterback controller, a quarterback puppeteer? Do you? Yeah, I mean, I'm a recovering asshole, dick, whatever you want to say. Also, I get it. There is an element of being a control freak that goes into being a high-level coach. But there also seems like there's this missing link where you got to let go at some point and allow your best 
player at the most important position to flourish and come into their own as opposed to telling them must throw here one must throw there two must throw there three we've got to be able to create some elements of that and I think you got a little bit of that with Purdy I don't know if he's ever going to be the elite of the elite to be able to do that consistently over the course of a you know 20 plus game season for multiple years but maybe you just hit the jackpot with that and that's the the meal ticket moving forward regardless uh, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I had a blast. I really appreciate you being so open and honest. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully the people got what they wanted for as far as being able to get this side-by-side view of us, making sure that we are not the same person. We do maybe look alike occasionally, but again, thank you so much. Best of luck this year. I appreciate you. Just kind of have a little baby head, man. This This hat is like a a little kid hat. Um, by no means um, would I do anything differently. I just wouldn't. Common sense tells me not to. Oh, is it over? Oh, you want to talk about the four clips for real? Yeah, the motherfucker, Tron Williams, missed the block. We should have got the deuce double team on the Trey Lance one. Jimmy Garoppolo needs to fucking throw hot to Samuel, who needs to run a fucking hot flat. Purdy, get rid of the fucking ball. Step up. Yeah. Samuel, maybe come around the edge and not be just a decoy out there. Fucking block someone on the edge. And then finally, you know, Johnson, you know, right guard, you got to be able to block someone. McCaffrey, give us a fucking help there on their way out. Not doing anything differently. Those are great calls. <laughs> Oh, shit. I'm hot as hell in this outfit. God damn.